Welcome to yet another episode of Deep Fart Fried. I am Whoa. TJ. This is Paul. This is Scotty. Deep Fart Fried TJ. Uh, Deep TJ, Fart really? Fried. Dun, 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 dun. So, uh, you know, I was setting up the DFF number one thing huh. back there. Huh. TJ. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was setting up the DFF number one <laughs> thing. <back there. laughs> TJ, TJ, TJ. Yeah, what's up? Oh, sorry, man. Go ahead. I set up the DFF number one thing back there. And it turns out that the, uh, the number one, <laughs> TJ, 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 the number one, TJ, yes. hey, TJ, behind you, <laughs> it says, it's, <laughs> it says retard, <laughs> it says retard. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you doing? What are you it's doing to me? Oh, what are shit. you doing to me? <laughs> Jesus. What's going on, TJ? Jesus, man. Just what was a that? joke, dude. What the hell? So because what? it said number one behind me, I'm like, oh, cool. I'm number one. And then Paul's like, bullshit. So he put the Paul, sign underneath. I didn't do shit. Don't blame that he shit He put on the me. sign underneath. It says number one, retart. Well, yeah. So apparently aren't I'm you? now the number well, one, Well, aren't you, Georgie? Retart. Yeah, there you go. Oh, God. That's going to hurt to pull it's off. It's not. Oh, it's it's going to come right off. It's barely sticking because of the hair in the first place. Well, I don't know. Let's see. Rip it off, Scotty. See, uh, tell us how much it hurts. Not at no, all. Not at all. Damn. It's gaffer tape. Gaffer tape oh, okay. doesn't stick to the hair, I guess. Got it. I didn't know it was. It sticks to the was, wall really nice. I thought it was duct tape. No, it's not duct tape. I was like, tape. Jesus Christ, If it was Scotty. duct tape, that would have been bad. <laughs> no way, dude. What the fuck, man? That's what I thought it was, dude. I don't think he would I should have been like, ah! Paul would be like, damn. The pain. Fuck. The horrible pain. Oh, by the way, TJ, that, uh, that book... Does not work on my phone, so okay. I, I, at some point I'll need you to Roger pull that. The, well, I will pull it up when it comes to that point. Thank you, thank you, TJ. I, pr- I appreciate that. So, not to del- not to uh, derail our uh, vamping. Yeah. I want us to vamp tonight. Yeah, you got to vamp. We're in a new space. We need to get. Yeah, we need the energy of the space. We need to loosen up. You know, we need to vamp a little bit tonight. Get some people, on. people love the pre-show banter, TJ. They love it. Uniformly. Except for the people that hate it. Which no. Is some of them. Those, don't, those people don't exist. Skip to 10 minutes and 41 Skip. seconds to get to the real show. <laughs> it's like, man. When these fat fucking retards quit blabbing <laughs> and finally get to well, the TJ. fucking point. TJ, I'm sorry, but you've already been canceled anyways, so... Dusty. Oh yeah, we're done, canceled, dude. Yes. Hashtag cancel TJ Kirk, dude. The arbiter of the internet has spoken, and you I, are canceled. I love how once again, like here, when Dusty thinks he has such ammunition on you with this, like I still own the rights to his amazing atheist site, so uh, I'll do whatever I'm gonna read. He was like, I'm gonna redirect that to a charity of my choice or some shit. And I was Uh, like, oh, wow. An immigrant charity. Also, uh, yeah, because you're so anti-immigrant, TJ. That would be be a charity that you, as the amazing atheist, would be just fucking dishonored to be associated with. With your rabid (laughs) anti-immigrant views, TJ. Dude, I just hate immigrants. I don't know what it is. Not to mention all the time between... People who weren't born in my same country, just hate them. Well, not to mention all the time in between that... Don't know why. It was like you and Dusty had a deal where you were selling T-shirts, so Dusty was profiting off that website. Oh, yeah, I forgot so, he invented the T-shirt. Yeah, I think that Dusty should uh, give all of the money he made off those T-shirts to that immigrant charity. Yeah. That'd yeah. be pretty cool. I yeah, mean, that why would, not? That would, sh- that would make a strong Dusty uh, should definitely you know, do that. Show that he doesn't stand by my bigotry. Dude. I mean, look, if he profited off that, I mean, Dusty has to make a moral stand and say, look, we sold How could a thousand he? T-shirts, and I made this amount of profit, and I just need to take that money and give it to that charity. How could he? Profit from such a vile, disgusting worm like TJ yeah. Kirk. <laughs> a fat, putrid worm <laughs> overflowing. The, the number, one, number retard. one retard. <laughs> yep. Yep. The most retarded person on the internet. The number one. I like when you said that, you sounded kind of Irish. It sounded like retarded. retarded. He's retarded. He's, a, he's the number one retard. <laughs> <laughs> Top of the morning to you. Retarded. <laughs> Give me my lucky charms. Oh, that I have to be lucky charms. Oh, yeah, God, dude. dude. <laughs> That's a terrible Irish accent. Yeah, dude, who cares? It's always like Irish that's all I've got though. It's always anyway. the kiss of the kiss of the Blarney Stone shit. You <laughs> yeah, know? It, like, it just really a little is. dude with a green pants uh, on. Good day to you. You know how I feel about people born in other countries. So. They, they don't, might as well not even. Exist. They don't even deserve an accurate depiction of. What about accent. when you're there though? No, and then, you have to deal with them directly. Then I feel like the immigrant, and I'm still against it. 
You know, you don't like that feeling. No, I mean, like you wish that when you went to some place like Amsterdam, to their own land. Oh, you feel you like know? an immigrant, TJ? No, dude. You know what? I feel like. I feel like I'm viewing the cattle, dude. I'm like, I'm making yeah. the rounds. I'm like, oh, look at these Irish folk, huh? Oh, I feel okay. like that's how People I would stick to their own land. Stick to your kind. I, I would feel like um, somebody from the imperial land surveying the uh, mm. the colonies. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would I take know. that kind of. You just feel to it. unclean because you know I don't even think America should bother conquering these places because we're just too superior. You know? I mean, we're superior, but. We should conquer them. It belittles us yeah, to are, even what own. What are you talking about TJ? Uh, I I disagree. My hatred goes in the other direction. We just where fucking I don't even want to part. We, we we just land in Ireland, dude, and we take it over. And what are they going to do? They're too drunk to respond. Right, but like, why do we even want Ireland? We already have the USA. That's the only thing we need. Because Ireland has more. things. That, but but then if we get Ireland, then Ireland becomes the USA, and the USA is bigger than it's it is now. It's not worthy though. Bigger is better, TJ. You know this. Dude, it's a foothold. The UK is next, dude. Bigger is better. Prove me wrong. They don't have to worry about Brexit, dude. Brexit, look, we can solve your guy. Look, all the people in the UK will solve your Brexit yeah. problem. You're part of America now. Yeah, Bre- problem it, solved. It, it, come on over here to America. You're gonna That's have way more power. Brexit. Look, those European faggots. They're gonna fucking have to bow to you now. I'm like, look, and then you can stop living this weird, conflicted life where you pretend that you're very different from the Americans, but you sim- simultaneously try and emulate everything about their culture, their music, yeah. and their lifestyle. I mean, you're not gonna lose much. I mean, you'll lose NHS. That's right. gone. You'll lose the pronunciation of certain words like you're gone. not allowed to call it a telly anymore no Fuck no no that. that's over uh, telly's done it's an elevator it's not a lift look fish and chips you guys are allowed to keep you know? that those are pretty delicious sure well, we, call, we, call we already call them that that's what i'm yeah. saying we're i'm fine with that look there's commonalities right we, we we're already oh, and flapjacks or pancakes or whatever the fuck yeah well, that's all mandated day one Yes. Right, all of your metric system is totally terms. banned. Oh, and uh, a cookie is now a cookie, and a chip is now a chip. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not allowed to call fucking. You know, there's nothing. There's no such thing as a crisp. That's not a thing for you anymore. You can say something's crispy though. Yeah, you can say a thing is crispy. These are some crispy potato chips, but it's a chip. Okay? A chip. And a biscuit. Hey, is what, a what big if there's fucking a wad of bread? But what if there's a potato chip it's brand a called cookie. crisps? A cookie is a cookie. or crispies. Um, I mean, that's a name then. There's, you know what? This will have to be worked out in what used to be Parliament, because we'll allow them to keep a regional government. So we'll, they have to rename. Oh, it. our puppet government. Sure. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah, yeah. And they can debate issues like that. Yeah, that's, perfect can, for, that's, a, that's perfect for we'll a puppet have, government. Of course. Change the spelling back to the American spelling, the proper spelling as it always was. I'm sure a lot of British citizens uh, listening oh, uh, to H us and now. Oh, the herb is silent. By the way, mm. that's another important. Yeah, there's thing. no it's herb not, not unless your name Stupid is Herbert. Stupid, limey cocksuckers need to remember. So. Yeah. The only time you ever say Herb in America is if you're referring to somebody that you don't like because that's an insult on the East Coast, calling somebody a Herb. Or if somebody's name is Herbert and they go by Herb. That's it. Or Herbie. But if you're talking about herbs, it's an herb. like herbs and spices, you don't Which say herbs weird. and spices. Which seems weird. Isn't that kind of backwards? It is backwards, Don't but you feel it's like the they should way. say herb and we should say herb? Yeah, yeah, but that's not how it goes. But that's not how it is. Yeah, that is true. So uh, It do H, be like that. The H is silent. America has decided. Yeah. Sometimes we go a little crazy. Well, usually we don't go along with that silent shit, but yeah. when it comes to herbs, we do. You know, I, you know it'll never happen, though? They got a chip on their shoulder. They were, were once a fucking colony. They lost that. They had the fucking 60s, Roxy, and all the, the British invasion. They had that. But now, I mean, the fucking, the worm has turned. We're fucking, in, we're on top now. Man, let's just do this whole show on how we want to just take over the fucking world now. I'm, I'm fired up about this shit, man. The world belongs to the fucking have to deal United with, States of America. Yeah, how, how are we going to deal with, like, China and Russia and shit? How are we going to get them? Because I want all that, too. Mm, bigger uh, than the, the bigger is the better. You know, nobody has refuted me on that yet, so I assume it's true. Uh, how do you get China Dude, I Russia? think that... Maybe set them against each other and then take over, like, what They remains. fight each other, and then the AI robot army just comes in and, and mops up yeah, the rest of the military. Yeah, hopefully by that time we've got it. And then it. it's just, you have to bow before the United States of I was America. thinking, like, we just start strategically airdropping vodka into Russia. And just, like, you know that they're not going to just leave that land I mean, around yeah, on the street. Chaos. So, it's, uh, yeah, it'll be Doesn't like... Doesn't most of it come from there anyway? Yeah, but they can't resist it. When they see a free bottle of vodka, they love it there. You know what I mean? It's not about, like, oh, here's something you're lacking. It's about here's more of something that we want you to fall into alcohol. Maybe we with. should just, uh, maybe we should, like, plant a puppet, like, you know, candidate over there, you know, that's, like... 
Don't they kill the... Yeah, but, like, we'll just make it, like... Even if they kill him, they'll just martyr him. Because his platform will be, like, free vodka for everyone. Oh, yeah, that's good. It'll be, yeah. like, UBI, but with vodka. Yeah, the vodka pa- oh, platform. Oh, your vodka ration, dude. And yeah. then, you know, once they kill him... It, I mean, once you introduce that idea into Russian society, it's going to collapse. Andrei Yangovich. Because if they kill him, he's just going to become more popular. Yeah, dude. I like it. Okay, that's good for that. What and about we'll China? We'll destabilize their country and then we'll swoop in. What do Chinese people like? Well, they we we know what they like from a lot of the explosive movies and shit. Mm, yeah. So maybe they love we, our movies in general. We can start planning like subtle mind control. Yeah. Suggestions mm-hmm. in the movies. Post hypnotic kind of stuff in the in yeah, the weird. Yeah, we'll make it real subliminal. Movies. It'll be overtly pro China, but it'll be like subliminally. Pro China America. can just be the beginning of the Borg Collective, dude. Like, like, look, everyone's gonna become one mindset, dude. It's like this is the ultimate fucking penultimate society. Oh, yeah. maybe we could, yeah, maybe we all could, the plug we'll in. Just dude. get one of our tech companies to premiere like the Borg software over there in China. They love to be collectivist anyway. Yeah. Once their whole culture is, uh, you know, hooked into it, and it'll turn out that we control it. Right, and then so we've got like, them all subjugated, and then they're all like, "Okay, now you you're all you know drones that work for us, and the Chinese will become our new army of like human cyborg kind of like drone things." Yeah, yeah, I like it. What about Africa? You know, I mean, it's pretty <laughs> easy. You know, you just, they don't really have any advanced weaponry or anything. We can just go in there and be like, "You're we control this now." That's how the British did it. Right, you're just advocating for just old school colonialism yeah, I mean, like, over just, there. Yeah, we can. We don't. I mean, you know, we don't. About Australia approach, though, yeah. they do have weapons. Fuck Australia, and they're crazy over there too. They're gonna be they're like, nuts. "Fuck you, you like, fucking yanks." One Australian can probably kill a hundred Americans. They are. That's how. Than that's kind. Well, yeah, because they're raised in a uh, place that has the no, strongest so look, beasts. Look, look, dude. Chinese army, that's when we just send them there. Oh, so you want to send the Chinese oh, Borg yeah. army to Australia? Okay, so once we got China and we mm. got our Chinese Borg I army. I mean, even if it's 10 to 1, dude, we win. This yeah, is the true. world's strangest game of risk, by the way. But, I like it. Uh, yeah, we send our Borg army into China, into uh, our Borg Chinese army into uh, Australia. We'll take that over that way. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah. What about South America? In Central America. Um, I mean, by that time, they're pretty much surrounded on all sides. So, right. so they really, they're probably just going to kind of piss their pants. They're going to wave the white flag. Just yeah. take it. Right. We're America, too. Yeah. yeah. See, si, senor. Yeah. They're just going to be like, you know, we're, they're not going to offer done. any resistance. Then, then, the, then, then it's planet America. Yes. Until the Antarctic ice people arrive. Yeah. All right. Show over. Thank you, guys. Become patrons if you like this. And uh, That was an easy one. Yeah. that would, Man, it felt like it flew by. Yeah. Oh, shit. It was only 14 minutes. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. That's probably not long Um, enough. All right. Let's do it. Didn't you pull some kind of other bullshit show? I I never agreed to any other show. I I was sold Uh, this as the America World Domination show. I'm not willing to do anything else. Uh, Hold on. I forgot. Well, we, we, that's all we got. Um, um, well, America's, well, I guess, I guess technically we <laughs> did, we delivered. I mean, America dominates the world in our scenario, so. Yeah. But if, uh, if, Paul, if, can you vamp for another hour and a half or something? Yeah. Like, yeah. Maybe we could just, like, kind of let Paul do, like, a stand up special. Uh, and we sure. Just, like, uh, you know what? A topic that really interests me is, like, because, um, you know, I'm a child of the <sighs> 90s. What about, like, government uh, uh, mishaps and, and massacres and law enforcement during uh, the 90s. It doesn't really sound that funny. It's know. probably not funny, but you just said vamp. You didn't say uh, funny vamp. All you right, know. fine. Fair enough. Let Paul do his thing, Scotty. I'm you sorry. and I are sitting this one out. All right, I'm sorry. Wow, your chair is creaky. You need some WD-40 or something. Oh, yeah. Damn, dude. Yeah, that's problematic. What the fuck is that? It wasn't doing that before. Yeah, he needs to spritz some. some I think maybe oil Stevie sat in that chair. And now it's fucked oh, up. Oh, he busted it, dude. Stevie done fucked your chair up, dude. You need to kick Stevie's ass. He done did it. Call Stevie. You need to call him, Scotty. No, call it, him. It was Stevie's fucking idea. He's coming here later, dude. What I'm gonna fuck th- it. What did you throw at me? Oh, it's a that booger. Piece, it's that piece of tape. Oh, I was hoping it was a booger. No, I actually did. Pull a show for tonight. Wow. But it, it didn't end up being exactly the show that we announced to the patrons because the first thing I did to research the show was go back and watch the other Waco show that we did. Right, because we said we were going to do the show about Waco. Right. And I found it to be a relatively comprehensive coverage of both David Koresh and the you know principal events of Waco and kind of a look at the media and all that. So I was like, oh, shit. I almost called you guys and was like, let's just pick something else to do because this Waco thing, we already kind of did it. But I kind of made it a challenge to find a way to angle Waco in, an angle maybe we didn't take on Waco, and I found one. But 
we've got to start a little before Waco. Um, in 1990 and in the 90s, there was kind of an uptick in the aggressiveness of the federal uh, government when it came to how they enforced laws, particularly against separatist movements. Right, like, which has always been tons in America. Right, but there was an actual uptick of them in the 90s, and right. it was seen as an escalation almost by the federal government to stamp down these I- identity-based, kind of Christian identity, white separatist, uh, anti-government uh, sentiment that was really strong in the 90s. Yeah. Um, and in fact, in fact, there was a there there were a lot of things that the government did in the '90s in the counterculture, infiltrating the counterculture in various ways. But when it came to enforcing the law of people that just said "fuck you," you can't come on my property, the government had a very heavy-handed way of dealing with things in the '90s. And we start tonight in the beautiful barren state of Idaho. This is a northern. Idaho Church of Jesus Christ Christian. St- and Stella- That's the stupidest fucking church name ever. <laughs> Aryan <laughs> Nation. It is the Aryan Nation. So Service. Not Mensa people Still the here. Center Sunday, of a lot of, 11 a.m. to and Wednesday at 7:30 p.m. And, right. this, and this part of the country is still a center for a lot of like the KKK and white power movements. Is Idaho? I don't know why Idaho in particular, but like remember like Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Well, I mean, it's very remote. It's a bunch of fucking white people butt fucking their sisters and shit. Butt so fucking course, potatoes, dude. The uh, area that the, I'm gonna stick a potato at my ass. The, <laughs> the the fucking Idaho equivalent of me didn't do a banana. He did a fucking potato. He did a potato. I'm gonna shove a fucking potato up my ass because I'm purebred white miracle. We go yeah. resign. If I was from Idaho, I, I go to I'd... Church of the Jesus Christ Christian Church of Jesus. <laughs> Aryan Nation, of course, because <laughs> because because black people and brown people are stupid. I like <laughs> uh, <laughs> scammy. Like, they scammy. Please going to the redundant away. Church of Redundancy dot com. Yeah. Fuck you. Richard Butler. That means his name was Dick Butler. Well, no. Yeah, the pastor. Yeah, Dick <laughs> Butler. Dick <laughs> Butler. What the fuck? Dude? Yeah, he was Dick. He, that's that's almost as bad as Dick Buttkiss. <laughs> Not quite. Not quite. No, no name in the history of names <laughs> has ever have... been as bad as Dick Buttkiss. Uh, good to meet you, Dick Buttkiss. Can yeah. you imagine being... Never mind. I don't want to digress too <laughs> no, far into no. the sad life of Dick Buttkiss, but... It, it must have been horrible. So uh, look, let me let me I'll, let me I'll be straight up with you. All right. Yeah. I know the name Ruby Ridge. Sure. I don't know what happened there. I don't even know what it's about. That is probably true of a lot of the people watching this show. So and it was, you're going to be teaching me something because sure. I don't really I don't really know about this event. I know a little bit about Waco. I know a little bit about some of the other ones we're talking about, but I don't really know much about Ruby Ridge or what sure. happened there or so what went down or anything. The principal um, character in the Ruby Ridge story is a guy named Randy Weaver. This is him here. Um, he looks was, kind of like an unassuming fellow. Yeah, he was um, a, a guy who moved his family to Idaho, who kind of has a pattern. If you look at his life, of an increasingly separatist kind of view, more and more racism creeps in until eventually he moves up to Idaho to be a part of this kind of Aryan conclave that's up there. Right, and he buys a piece of property on a place called Ruby Ridge which was described by the local law enforcement as one of the most remote places that you can be in Idaho. One of the hardest to reach, one of the most remote, mountainous, strange, off-the-map kind of places in Idaho. And this guy built a giant cabin and kind of complex of buildings up there. Where did he get the money? Um, That's a good question. Um, He was, um, before all of this... I didn't really look into his early life, honestly, because I know I, I wasn't going to spend too much time character uh, studying Randy Weaver, so I don't know. Mm. But looking at the com- complex that he built, I, I do know that they they subsisted a lot on donations. Okay, so he's getting he's from, getting money what, from, was from it, white supremacy. Was, right. was it like a commune kind of thing, or was it yes. just his family? It, people would come and go, yeah, his family lived there, but it was used by the great by a lot of people, a lot of the white nationalists. Well, I don't want to call them white nationalists because they weren't exactly that at this time. Like the, the Aryan Nation. Christian identity yeah, movement kind sure. of Aryan Nation guys. Yeah, it was, and it was a very self-sustaining thing, but I do, I do remember reading in my research that he, um, at the time he was living there, he was pretty much hand-to-mouth from that community. It says here that he originally uh, 
after he got out of the army, he wanted to become an FBI agent. But he uh, he did he dropped out of the criminal justice program because it was too expensive. Right. Uh, so he actually just worked at a local uh, John Deere factory, and uh, that's so like a blue collar so guy. He's not. Yeah, not. A, I mean, so he managed to do this probably because he was charismatic and kind of seen as a leader in that Aryan community. And they, with their donations, supported he and his family living this kind of separatist lifestyle in this very remote place. So on October twenty fourth of 1989, Randy uh, meets, unbeknownst to him, with an undercover ATF agent, and he allegedly sells them two sawed-off shotguns, which is a weapons violation. This right. is 1989. Um, in, uh, on June 12th, 1990, the government agents offer to drop the charges, so they meet with them. They tell them, hey, we got you selling this shit. You sold, you know, contraband. But they offered to drop those charges if he agreed to become an informant concerning illegal activities of the members of the Aryan Nations, a white supremacist organization with a stronghold in northern Idaho. Randy refused the offer and went directly to the leadership structure of that Aryan Nation and told them that they were under investigation. Um, so then, of course, he's indicted on right. the fire. Right, of course. So not long after, just a, a scant few months later, he's indicted on uh, federal f- firearms charges. Now, this is where it gets kind of sketchy to okay. me. Um, federal agents arrest Randy at gunpoint, and he and a- as he and Vicky traveled down the mountain to purchase supplies, okay? Randy's jailed for a day, then released on bail. Pretty standard. Randy receives a letter on January 21st informing him that his trial has been scheduled for March 20th, though the actual trial date was February 20th, one month earlier. Right. When Randy fails to show up for his court date, he's declared a fugitive and a warrant for his arrest is issued. So right, okay. this whole thing now you could say that was a clerical error. Uh, it's, a, it's possible, but it's it sounds po- it sounds like a setup. Exactly it, to me, it sounds like it this does. guy this guy refused to take our fucking um, refused to take our uh, our deal. So some pissed off ATF agent, or and in whatever. fact blew blew up our fucking investigation of this Aryan nation thing. So fuck him. We're gonna railroad him. Yeah. So he didn't show up for trial. Now he's a fugitive, right? Telling y'all is sabotage. Well that's, they, well, that's how a lot of these cases are broken, though, is they, they get someone that's in the inner circle to do something illegal, and they say, look, and obviously with him, it's like he's probably selling guns on the side. Right. And they did, he they, probably was. And, yeah. they, and, they, and they pop him on a federal charge, and they expect him to go, yeah, I don't want to go to prison, so yes, I'll just do what you want. And he didn't do that. And he didn't do it. He's like, I'll take the jail time, basically. So uh, when Randy fails to show up for his court date, he's declared the fugitive. Uh, so he immediately retreats with his family to the compound at Ruby Ridge. And Vicki Weaver starts writing, uh, according to the federal government, threatening letters um, saying things like the tyrant's blood will flow and shit to federal agencies because Randy sees the same thing that we see. He feels like immediately he's being railroaded. He's being set up by the government. Obviously, they're just trying to strip his freedom from him. And, you know, that's how he felt about it. Mm -hmm. And his family felt uh, similarly. And uh, so the Weavers did not leave their land during the 16 months after Randy was declared a fugitive. So for over a year, his family um, lived at Ruby Ridge, almost self-sufficiently relying entirely on supplies that were kind of brought in by the local community that supported them. Who They'd kind of become a rallying post for that local Aryan community now. Right, because they're under siege by the federal government, right. basically. So all these all these kind of separatists and anti-government types that had conglomerated around this stronghold in, in northern Idaho of uh, white separatist people had found kind of a martyr in uh, Randy Weaver and his family and were happy to support them. So shit hit the fan in uh, August of 1992. A U.S. Marshal Special Operations Group sets up a command post and uh, begins active surveillance of the Weaver property. And you can see them kind of this actual around. actual pictures of them setting up what looks like a military fucking operation, right? Right. They're taking this very seriously. <clears throat> of course. They got choppers. They got fucking, uh, you know, trucks, trucks full of supplies. Full of supplies and, and cops. Military and looking vehicles. And, and there yeah. looks like they've rented some U-Hauls to probably get some equipment in there. So, um... SOG stands for Special Operations Group uh, in the in the next kind of part here. So a three man SOG team armed with cameras and weapons went for a hike around the Weavers' property. 
um, kind of scoping it out and seeing who was there and seeing if they could make contact with him and maybe make a peaceful arrest or whatever. Who knows what they were thinking? Uh, the Weaver's dog starts barking. The Weavers leave their cabin to investigate. Uh, Kevin Harris, who was a guy that was staying with the family, he's actually kind of an adopted son of the family. He was a local boy that whose parents were horrible and you know ended up kind of dying pretty young, and they took him in. So he's one of the family, but just a different name. Uh, Kevin Harris and Sammy Weaver, who was uh, Randy Weaver's 14-year-old son, um, uh, came to investigate the dog barking. Sure. When uh, Kevin Harris and Weaver came within a few yards of uh, Agent William Deegan, he points a gun at them and shouts, Stop! U.S. Marshal! Harris responds by fatally shooting the Marshal uh, with his rifle, prompting fellow Marshal Larry Cooper to fire three times at Kevin Harris. So this has become a, a complete and utter shit show. Yeah, now that's a it's gun a battle. Shooting match. Yeah, it's a gun battle now. Right. Um, a third nearby marshal, and this is fucking, this just makes me want to fucking bomb the entire agency. A third nearby marshal, Arthur Roderick, shoots and kills the Weaver's dog, Stryker, <sighs> fearing that it would give away his position. Yeah, the well, shooting right. of the dog prompts Sammy Weaver, the 14-year-old whose dog it was, to fire at the marshal. Cooper returned fire at Sammy, killing the boy. Wonderful. So now we've got Kevin Weaver wounded, one dead marshal, one dead 14-year-old boy, and his dog. That's the, that's what this that's what this operation has turned up so far. Awesome. So great special operations unit that they've got set up here, right? Crack team, dude. Emphasis on special. Um, Kevin Harris retreats to the Weaver cabin. By nightfall, Ruby Ridge is literally crawling with agents from the U.S. Marshal's office, the county, U.S. Border Patrol, the state police, the FBI, and the Idaho National Guard, amongst others. And a massive amount of... Lo- this was like a shit shit... They, they basically surrounded right, them. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, this surrounded. was seen as like, uh, like a potential like shit show of epic proportions, and every law enforcement asset within reach was sent. Um, of course, the citizens, once word filtered down what had happened up at the uh, Weaver place on Ruby Ridge, citizens started protesting at the roadblocks that they set up at, you know, the road that led up Ruby Ridge to the, to the place. Because, of course, they're going to try and cordon these people off so they can't get supplies. Um, and the locals started to protest. Um, so as if it couldn't get worse. As if August of 1992 couldn't get worse for federal law enforcement, here was their response. The the FBI revised its rules of engagement to allow agents to fire at Weaver if he can be shot without endangering others. So this is preemptively shooting a guy that's not aware of it. An American, right? Well, that's basically authorizing an extrajudicial killing. Right. He hasn't been—I mean, he is a fugitive— Right. But unless he's a direct threat, usually they, exactly. they don't shoot people first. Well, the FBI decided in 1992 that that's not how they rolled anymore. They, ch- they basically changed the rules of engagement. Yep. Yep. Um, a crowd of spectators, including many anti-government activists, begins gathering near Ruby Ridge, as I said. Television crews set up camp. So it starts to become a national story, which is exactly what all these agencies don't want. Yeah, of course. Because what I just told you about what went down the first night is horrifying. Um. But it just gets worse. When the Weavers decide to leave their cabin and go to a nearby shed where they had put Sammy, their 14-year-old son's body, FBI sniper Lon Horiuchi took a shot at Randy, uh, hitting him in the right arm. So d- fails to kill the guy but wounds Jesus. him. Jesus. They they so they're they're heading to the shed where the boy's body is. God. They sh- they just take a pop shot at him from the trees from a from a, from up on the ridge somewhere. They run back to the cabin. So Vicky Weaver, his wife, holding her baby, a, a 10-month-old infant in her arms, stands next to the cabin door holding it open for the uh, wounded Weaver. Horiuchi fires a second bullet that passes directly through Vicky's head and hits Harris in his chest. So now they've literally sniped a woman holding her 10-month-old baby in arms. And they had no idea. They, these people had no idea they were even under, you know, like guns. It's okay though, Paul, because they were racist, <clears throat> right? So this has become an epic fucking shit show. 
that that alone um, sparked some violent outbursts amongst the protesters when this word trickled down the mountain that they had literally shot Vicky Weaver. It sent the protesters into a tizzy. There was a group of dudes, uh, skinheads, that tried to go up the mountain via like a back path that were caught with a bunch of guns and supplies in the back of their shit trying, trying to, to join the fight, right. basically. Well, right. I mean, everyone knows, I mean, under the U.S. Constitution, you have a right to a fucking trial. And, I mean, for someone to just be killed, I mean, yeah, he was a right... Yeah, they saying, it, I'm they not go saying, in there like Judge Dredd just yeah, blowing motherfuckers away. I'm not saying he was away. a great guy, but, I mean, the circumstances, I mean, they shot... They, they kill him, basically. They shot his wife in the fucking head, holding a fucking 10-month-old baby... You want to know what some listen to this little tidbit. I didn't even I write this down this. because I knew I would remember it. Listen to that. That Lon Horiuchi sniper guy that killed Vicky Weaver didn't know that he'd even hit her. He thought that she'd hit the deck from the sound of the report of his rifle. So the next day they had a loudspeaker talking to Vicky, asking her if she'd like to let the kids come out and have a picnic, not knowing she's dead. <laughs> They send a robot that tries to bring a phone with that, like a satellite phone, like a like a a robot up, yeah. calling Vicky's name and saying, "Vicky, come take this phone. You can talk to us about a picnic for the kids," not knowing she's dead yet. And this dude comes out and goes, "I'm gonna shoot this robot if you don't leave." And it turned around and left. So it was through that robot, though. He said, "Vicky's dead." That that they learned that they had killed her. Sounds like a really well put together operation. This dude. whole operation was Surgical. a shit show. You know, why, why are they just sending? If, if, look, if that's what they're planning on doing, just send it in Seal Team Six, kill them all, and just go. Well, just done. napalm them from the fucking yeah, sky. Yeah, drop a bomb on these Be motherfuckers. More merciful than fucking this shit. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what the fuck, dude? Like, this is not. <laughs> and look, at any time. I mean, they even let him go. It's like, why not just hold them like without fucking bail? So them? there's now, so many different white things they could have done. I mean, it's just a massacre at this point. Right. So th they've now shot Kevin Harris twice. Vicky is dead. The 14 year old son is dead. The dog is dead. <laughs> Strikers. It's him and the baby, I guess. It's him, the the baby. Well, no, Kevin is still alive. Yeah. Kevin is shot in the chest and the arm and is in desperate need of medical attention. But he's alive at this point. After this shooting of Vicky. The remaining children, which included a, a young a young girl as well as the infant, so there were two children, uh, Randy Weaver and Kevin Harris alive. They remained in their house for eleven days. Uh, on August thirty first, nineteen ninety two, Kevin Harris surrendered to get desperately needed medical attention. He was dying basically. Yeah. And after Randy had been promised representation by a famed defense lawyer, Gary Spence, the Weavers surrendered finally to federal authorities. Um. On April 14th, 93, the murder trial of Randy Weaver and Kevin Harris opens in the federal courthouse in Boise before Judge Edward Lodge. On the fourth day of that trial, during the siege of a religious compound near Waco, Texas, a fire breaks out and 80 members of the Branch Davidian cult are killed. Jurors in the Weaver trial are told to ignore the incident. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's so easy to ignore. Um which provided me kind of a nice little launching point. Now, I will tell you that Randy Weaver ended up getting cleared of um, any uh, anything other than the gun charges and served... Uh, Certainly it's worth murdering his family over. Yeah, yeah, of course. He served uh, a total 14-month sentence, of which he had served 12 by the time his uh, trial was finished. So he only served about two or three months in prison. And then when he was released, filed a massive civil suit against the government for the wrongful deaths of his son and his wife um, and won. Uh, he, he received a $3 million settlement. Uh, Kevin Harris received a similar settlement, and the government basically admitted ma major wrongdoing. <laughs> I mean, they. Uh, and, and, and it seems like at every point, I mean, whatever you think about this guy's beliefs and the escalation, like the government... Kept escalating, escalating, they escalating. The, yeah, they were a, they were not a force of moderation, mediation, and solution. They were a force of escalation. At every step, they had the choice to walk it back and say, "Whoa, let's go at this from a more human angle." And they didn't. Yeah, I mean, it's like, look, there's a family in here. Even if he's wanted on these charges, like, let's try to come up to a, a compromise right. where he, you know, there are I children mean, here. I mean, look, it, it's like you know they're they're sneaking around this compound, like they're in the middle of nowhere. They don't know what the fuck is going on. 
I mean, like, obviously they're part of the separatist movement, so it's like, what do you expect? If you're like, like, there's there's different ways they could have approached this. And, I mean, look, if violence happens, sometimes violence is going to happen no matter what. But of this, course. It just seems like this is not a case where it needed to and happen. And I'm not trying to say that I'm Nostradamus and I can say that this wouldn't have had sure. a violent end otherwise. I'm of just course. saying that as the facts have been released, and the facts are pretty clear about that day because there were multiple trials, including a manslaughter trial for the sniper, Ron Horiuchi. Uh, he eventually beat the rap, uh, unfortunately. But I think it's very interesting that it went to the point where he was allowed to be prosecuted for the uh, obviously uh, neglectful killing of this woman when he was uh, under orders to not only fire on Weaver if he could do so and other people were protected. I mean, that's a pretty clear manslaughter to me. Yeah. Um, he was vi in violation of his orders if he was firing a sniper rifle anywhere near that. So anyway... Um, we have covered Waco, and yes. pretty comprehensively, and if you haven't seen that show, it's almost a year old now. It's, it's actually a, a little over a year it's old. It's not called Waco. It's called this. It's called David Koresh. No, it's actually called or Waco. Is it? Yep, it's okay. called Waco equals Deep Fat Fried, and uh, rightfully so. I thought it was. Uh, I thought we did it about David more about David Koresh. They, the show, the show does does focus heavily, but we ended up naming it Waco. So I'm just oh, letting okay. people know where to find it. And we can probably put it in the description of this as yeah, well. Yeah, probably a good idea. Um, but anyway, if you want, if you haven't seen that, I really recommend that maybe you pause this now and go do that because um, it's pretty comprehensive and we cover a lot of stuff. And we're not going to go as in depth uh, on David Koresh and his ideology because we've covered that already. We're going to cover. Uh, with kind of a laser focus, the principal events leading up to and the prosecution of the siege at Waco, which a lot of people might not be familiar with um, as right. well. Well, it happened in 92. So. Right. It is an older thing. You know, that's uh, 25 years ago or something at that point, at this point. So, um, so 26 in 1992, Texas Child Protection Services ended an investigation into claims of child physical and sexual abuse made against the Branch Davidians and David Koresh. Um, in Waco, uh, well, we said, we said Waco. Um, so in Waco, Texas, uh, um, the Branch Davidians began to obviously distrust the government at this point. Right. And um, the investigation found no evidence. <laughs> no evidence okay. whatsoever. And the inve But the investigators were all, and these were people that had left the Branch, Branch Davidian compound that had made these allegations. No evidence was found. But one, of the, one part of the allegations made were the weapons. Now, of course, Child Protective Services can't do anything about somebody having a bunch of weapons They're in Texas. They're not there to look for the weapons. But they're, they're to look into the that child little piece thing. of information made its way to the relevant authorities. Um, now, here's a piece of happenstance that is heavily disputed by conspiracy theorists. And let me tell you, both Ruby Ridge and Waco are ripe, or rife, sorry, not ripe. Well, they're ripe and rife. <laughs> With conspiracy angles. Of course. And when you're searching on the internet, you're going to run into them naturally, and they look like normal news sources. I mean, I had to I had to be careful about what I pulled from here. Right, because there's all kinds of... When you get to this government stuff, I mean, you right. know, you get and all the, the truth is out government there. Government covered and, it up. Uh, right. So in May 1992, a UPS driver reported that a package had broken open while it was heading towards the Branch Davidians compound. Mm -hmm. The package had grenades in it. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God. Kind of weird to send grenades, UPS. Yeah. All right. The incident puts the group on the ATF's radar. Okay. Conspiracy theorists say that this is a convenient, obvious setup to allow them to justify um, the actions of you know, raiding maybe, this maybe, compound. Maybe that happened, but, uh, you know, I, I got to say, I kind of side with the conspiracy theorists there. That sounds pretty fucking implausible to me. But also, I mean, they, they were stockpiling a lot of arms, so but I just, it's I very feel, possible. I don't, feel like did, send a, I don't feel like you send a big box of grenades via UPS. Like, you hire someone to drive that Not to necessarily. You. Maybe. I don't Not know. Not necessarily. I mean, I'm, I'm sure shit like that I, mean, I don't know. I, can, I can't say uh, 100%. I mean, I don't think anyone can. But it's kind of remarkably convenient. Can, it is plausible. This, I can see why it's an element that conspiracy theorists dispute. That. Sure, yeah, I can Let's definitely put it see that. It's way. interesting to say the least. So, August twenty first to the thirty first, nineteen ninety two, the FBI and the United States Marshal Service take part in an eleven day standoff and shootout with Randy Weaver and his family after Weaver failed to appear in court over firearms charges, which we just covered. That standoff at Ruby Ridge, Idaho, resulted in the death of a U.S. Marshal and Weaver's wife. We covered this. Sorry. 
Um, I just thought it was interesting that this happened after Waco had started, you know, the investigation. So Waco, Waco. Waco was already getting started, and then Ruby Ridge happened right. during that I mean, time. Waco wasn't started in terms of the siege or the But or the, the Waco had passport. already gotten on the government's radar right. at that point. Exactly. Um, and there's also evidence that, um, uh, you know, among other things that had happened, one of them being the beating of Rod- Rodney King by the LAPD. Right. This also helped to radicalize the Branch Davidians. They were aware of these things happen and knew that they had their this had their names all over it. These are outsiders in society getting stomped to the ground by the government, you know. So they saw a reflection of themselves in Ruby Ridge and in Rodney King. Right. Um, so um, it increased it. So it, it actually worked to increase anti-government sentiment like Ruby Ridge uh, and militia membership went up. Like, right. There was an explosive like growth because people are starting to feel like the government of the United States is like really our enemy. Well, in a right. Way. Well, well, before it's like you have these these pivotal events. It's like you can have people say, well, what have they ever really done? But then people can start pointing to these rallying cries. It's like, you know, well, if you go back to the Revolutionary War, it's like Bunker Hill. There's I mean, like there's yeah, always when these people things. can start shouting like Ruby the Bos- Ridge, the Boston you know? Massacre, the Ruby Ridge. Is always the- and when people can start pointing to shit, people go, you know what? Maybe you have a fucking point. Look what the government did there. And if you buy into the conspiracy theory or if you buy into the say hey, the story's not going complete we don't know yeah it's just when you have that vacuum a lot of bad shit comes in that 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 sort of space sure um so february 28th 1993 we get to the uh part of the story that's relevant to the picture that's on the screen uh the atf attempts to execute an arrest and search warrant on the branch davidian compound in waco the warrants were based on the testimony of ex-Branch Davidian members who claimed firearms violations as well as the sexual and physical abuse of children, which had already been investigated by tex- uh, Texas CPS and found no evidence of child right. abuse. But the AT- I mean, the, the purview of the ATF right. is the firearms. The firearms, of course. Right so that was the name. So that gives them the auspices to go in. Of course. Um, and they think they're going to... They think they're going to go in and, and fucking conquer this shit in 20 minutes, right? Right, exactly. They thought it was going to take about 20 minutes to clean this whole thing up. The Branch Davidians were tipped off, however, and this is a funny story. So there's a news reporter who had been tipped off by somebody in the ATF that there was going to be a big raid. And the news reporter goes wandering around Waco and finds somebody going down the road. And he's like, hey, do you know where that crazy Branch Davidian compound is? I heard there's going to be a raid over there. <laughs> well, that dude that he stopped. That's why ha- you don't tell the fucking exactly. media. Exactly. That dude that he stopped to ask directions to the fucking compound was a Branch Davidian who immediately doubled back, went to the compound, and told the guys that they were about to be raided. It actually says it was David Koresh's brother-in-law. Yeah. Yep. That he asked So it's like... So not only did he ask a Branch Davidian, he asked one that was like literally in David Koresh, like d- related, not by blood, but closely related to David Koresh through family ties. Right. So, I mean, just like the worst possible person you could, but like, you, how does the ATF telling a fucking reporter about an upcoming raid, that's ridiculous. And it just shows that they just wanted they wanted someone there to fucking show what fucking badass heroes they are for shutting down this compound. Right. I, that's what it sounds like. And then this dumb fucking reporter can't keep his fucking if, mouth shut either. Well, the reporter's basically salivating because they're like, I, I have this fucking juicy story well, I'm going to cover. But think about the laziness of that reporter to not know how to get to this compound before he went right. down there. To, to just, just go ask like, I'm some go random ask yokel world. that you don't know who the fuck they are, what right. the fuck they, they know. In the town where these people live, so you don't know whose sympathies lie where. It's just so stupid. But that's, that's what happens. And so an operation that these guys thought was going to take 20 minutes because of the shock and awe of it. I mean, they sent like something like 70 agents to like attack this compound from every uh, corner, but they were prepared for it. So four ATF agents got killed. At least 16 others uh, in uh, were injured amongst the ATF. An undetermined number, but I was able to find uh, sources that said six Branch Davidians are thought to have been killed and in wounded. That fucking first wave. Um. Uh, well, killed, and then an undetermined number were wounded in the raid, right. including Koresh, who was wounded in his hip and his wrist by uh, glancing gunfire and right. shrapnel. So um, nothing life-threatening on him, but he, he was wounded himself in the in the raid. With the death of federal agents, the FBI now had jurisdiction over the raid, and a standoff had begun. Um, so I thought this would be kind of an interesting point, because, of course, this failed raid is a huge black eye for the ATF. Four 
agents killed and the target was not taken down, it's a stain. They, the FBI has to come in and take the reins over. You can imagine the ego hit that that is. Right. The ATF is probably not happy that they failed and another government agency had to take over. Yeah, and you can see here in the picture that TJ put up, um, uh, this is a, a tank, a federal tank patrolling uh, uh, the perimeter of the compound with uh, a banner that they've hung up saying, Rodney King, we understand. So they definitely felt a sense of solidarity in terms of being under the boot of uh, the authorities. Yeah. And at this time, I mean, I don't know, there was just a... I I don't want to say, like, it's gone now, because obviously there's still a lot of anti-government sentiment and stuff like that. But at this time, there was really this idea as the government, as an antagonist, not just secretly controlling things, but really like that boot heel of right. the government is coming to crush Oh, yeah, oh, an, an, yeah an open antagonist. Yeah, and right. that was a huge part of, of, of David Koresh's uh, ideology, too. Even before this happened, he was always a guy that was preaching that eventually the government was going to come to take the guns, and he was one of those guys. You know what? I thought of another way this banner could be interpreted. Yeah. What if it's not Rodney King, we understand? What if it's Rodney King, we understand? Like, beat the <laughs> yeah, shit. I got you. <laughs> you. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, us? Rodney King, we understand. But us? Come on. I don't know. I don't think of... I, yeah, I, th- I, I, think, I think the, the first, first sentiment, interpretation yeah. is probably correct, but, <laughs> but yeah. Anyway. That just shows um, lang- the, the pliability of language and context and stuff. So, um... I thought it'd be a f- kind of an interesting thing to take a look at and take a look at some cool pictures from Little that side time. side quest. Yeah, at the uh, wonders of capitalism. Because, of course, Yay. this is a media event now, so people come far and wide to see the crazy compound, to get as close we as they can. Ain't coming out. And, uh, of course, if there's people gathering for an event, there are capitalists there to sell them shit. Um, this is T-shirt salesman Tom Dobioski. He's putting up a U.S. flag in the center of a shirt display as he prepares for business from a roadside vendor area near the Davidian so compound. F- people hear like, wow, there's like this big stand- government standoff going and crowds are gathering. Why not make a buck? So he's like, sounds like a good place to sell some T-shirts. Yeah. I mean, it's probably right. Yeah. So um, I pulled some other pictures of there's some really cool ones, um, but I, f- I tried to find the really kind of neat ones. But. Um, I'm, I'm kind of simultaneously, uh, filled with pride at this and disgusted by it. And I don't know, I think I'm 50, 50. Yeah, it's very, I, I definitely understand what you're saying. Cause I feel the same way. Like on one hand, it's like very industrious and clever and, and I like living in a country where people are on that hustle. You know what yeah, I mean? It's and, like, you know, these guys are, yeah, they're out there making that buck. Right. And everyone's trying to do that to some extent or another, so it's kind of hard not to have some admiration for the cleverness of their little scheme. But on the other hand, I mean, you're selling T-shirts at a fucking massacre, right? You know, so these guys, or something that's gonna become a massacre. I survived the Waco massacre T-shirt, and if you act now, I'll throw in another one. Right, and and this is a T-shirt uh, stand set up, by the way, right near or behind another vigil that was set up for the four ATF agents that were killed that day. So I thought that was an interesting right, uh, spot see. to sell your T-shirts to. But, you know, a capitalist has got to sell, man. Um, there's a really cool... Yeah, They're th- still dead. What do you want us to do? This is a local Waco TV station, so you'll have to forgive the quality of it. But I thought it was really an interesting look at how people felt about this and the people, the kind of people... That came to look at this while it was going on. Sightseers, Waco, 6 p.m. package, Saturday. Let's see the standoff, 6, kids. 1993. Hopefully it'll play at a degree. It will. Come on, you want to see through these glasses and see about the idea where it's at? Yeah, let me see it. Uh, is. Visitors are coming from everywhere to McLennan Look County. Them, kids. Ernest and Jean Baden were on their way home to Maryland when they decided to make a quick detour to Waco. You taking some pictures? Wow, that's loud. Yeah, we <laughs> we should probably turn that. Uh, yeah, you know what? Did I? I I've turned it down. On where's our, the capitalist out here fucking selling yeah, binoculars or renting them? Down like, for look, us as well. Get a fucking telescope set up, dude. Like, look, get a great view of the compound. Yeah. Ten bucks a minute. Get you a looky loo at the compound. And this is like an old archival site too, so this is like Web 1.0 video. So my apologies, yeah. but I, I've got to prove to them people back home that we saw it. <laughs> <laughs> they might think I'm telling fibs. What are you gonna tell them when you get back home to Maryland? Yeah, I saw where that crazy nut was. <laughs> <laughs> Compound watchers estimate as many as a thousand people have stopped here, all hoping to get a glimpse of the fortress. Anybody else like to look through this? 
Woody Lambert let sightseers peer through his old binoculars. He's been the so-called tour guide here for the last five days, offering visitors a free peek at the compound. If I had a dollar for all of them it has, I could buy me a new pickup truck. Unlike Woody, some people are hoping to make a profit off Waco's infamous attraction. Debbie Carlisle is selling these t-shirts for 10 that shirt sucks. Yeah, what I mean, but fuck? you can you can see it's prescient. And, yeah, but it sucks. I mean, you see the tank. I mean, it, it's remarkably prescient. I had to pause it too when I first was looking at this to pull it. I was like, holy shit! This is before the count. The compound was burned, before the raid that ended in the deaths of eighty eight people there. And here's a person going like, "Yep, it's gonna happen, bitch." It's Ten coming, Vernon. It's coming. Pop, and she sold thirty in just a couple of hours. And so on. Uh, all around Waco. I don't know that they'd be that popular at Mount Carmel. You have to look at the skyline. So what's the attraction, and why are so many people wanting a peek? Well, I think you want to be maybe a part of history. <laughs> wow, that guy's teeth were I think amazing. you might want to be a part of history, like, like my front teeth. <laughs> history. Yeah. <laughs> They're history, too. Look back on. It's kind of quiet town. Things like this don't happen, you know, not around Waco. Even... Uh, yeah, they do. I guess they did guess this they, time. Yeah, it wrong. Is, it is happening right yeah. now. With binoculars, sightseers are having the same trouble federal authorities are. They just can't get a clear picture of what's going on inside. <laughs> so that's it. Um, so yeah, I just thought it was interesting that this little capitalistic thing was set up. And there was another interesting connection that I found. Yeah, this is one of the most interesting capitalists there. Um, yeah, so there's a uh, bumper sticker salesman that was there that was selling bumper stickers. Interesting. Uh, huh. That said, fear the government, that fear your guns. Um, when guns are outlawed, I will become an outlaw. Politicians love gun control. A man with a gun is a citizen. A man without a gun is a subject. Wow. And uh, ban guns, make the streets safe for government takeover. That was... Yeah. He and looks the, kind of vaguely almost familiar. Yeah, a little familiar, huh? Kind of a familiar face. Who is that? Uh, well, uh, this guy's name was Timothy McVeigh. Um, hmm. Timothy Not McVeigh. Not the bell yeah. so far. Far. He went on. It, I, I can. I can't blame you for not remembering. Uh, he went on to uh, perpetrate a horrible bombing in uh -huh. Oklahoma City uh, a couple of years after Waco. Oklahoma City. Yeah, we'll bombing. talk. We'll talk a little bit about uh, that a little later. But I found it really interesting that uh, he was one of these capitalists that uh, decided that he would uh, an uh, industrious young citizen yeah. out there peddling his wares. Um. So one of the things about Waco and Ruby Ridge that I found interesting in the research was I assumed that public sentiment was pretty bad about both of these incidents at the time. But I was wrong. Um, public sentiment was squarely behind the government, both in Ruby Ridge and in Waco, even after the massacre, um, even after the compound burned down. Yeah, you got to love a citizenry that's like, yeah, then the ATF showed up and shot a Thank woman you. holding a baby through her head and killed her. Yeah. And America's like, yep, sound good. But yeah, yeah, the perspective of most Americans at that time is going to be turning on television and it's going to be reported in a kind of cold, detached way. <laughs> Americans like, are a bunch of dumb fucking cunts. Well, I mean, three Let's out of real. four well, Americans, it's estimated from polling data and stuff, uh, were uh, supportive of the ATF. Well, before the... Uh, variety of opinions you get today, TJ. Would you have really thought any different if you just saw a news broadcast? You're damn right, I would have. I'd have been maybe. I'd have been that. Maybe fucking, you'd have been. I'd be wearing my tinfoil hat, Scotty. No, you probably would have been like, "That's crazy." Then you would have continued on with your life. I'd be on Team Alex Jones, bitch. But obviously, there was an undercurrent of this. The, I mean, one of the things we haven't really, uh, I think, explored is that there was definitely an undercurrent of this kind of sentiment. I mean, Timothy McVeigh shows up there. I mean, he's already got these bumper stickers. It's already part of his philosophy and what he believes. I mean, of course. Of course, yeah. The, I mean, like I said, um, around the time of Ruby Ridge, militia um, you know, membership was exploding in America, um, and Ruby Ridge drove a lot of that explosion. And, um, you know, Timothy McVeigh was one of those kids that got kind of wrapped up in the Christian identity movement, which is strongly linked to white separatism and uh, anti-government rhetoric and all that shit. And he was there, you know, he's there at Waco as one of these people that had drawn a line in the sand, you know, because there were supporters. He was he was there more like a, as a supporter of the Branch Davidians right to be there. So he wasn't one of these, uh, you know, you're going to get what's coming to you guys. He was the one in four Americans that did not approve. Yes, um, definitely. 
So according to the documentary Waco Rules of Engagement, which I recommend you watch, I watched for the research of this, and it's really fucking good, and several accounts by surviving members, there were uh, several uh, tactics which were used to demoralize the members of the uh, the Branch Davidian compound during the 51-day siege. Uh, For almost two months, loudspeakers played the sounds of rabbits being slaughtered, the sounds of dentist drills, uh, clips from talk shows about how David Koretsch uh, was hated. Um, They played this 24 hours a day through loudspeakers aimed at the compound. Um, Flashing bright lights were also another technique used. This is um, a PSYOP, is what they call it, a psychological operation. Um, uh, an attempt to uh, solve a situation by psychologically breaking down the people that are holed up somewhere, right? And um, in this case, there were children in that building. So can you imagine being a child for three months or two months, just every day, all day, the blaring sounds of animals dying and ho- just horrible sound. Nobody likes listening to a fucking dentist drill hitting a tooth. I mean, not to mention the how traumatic it is to have a fucking you know, raid. Right. Where people are being shot at. I mean, bullets are whizzing by. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, and so there are children in here. One of the things that cropped up after Ruby Ridge was a kind of internal argument amongst federal law enforcement, particularly the FBI. Um, uh, It was a culture clash almost between um, kind of a negotiation wing of, of the, uh, the agency and uh, a tactical wing. So there were negotiators that thought we really need the impetuses on us to find, especially like in, in things like this with our families or children, we need to find a peaceful resolution. So it's like diplomacy versus right. the sword, basically. Right. And But this was super hot at this time in the FBI. And it was almost like one hand was undermining the other. So what would happen is, is negotiators would, they actually at one point had a negotiator stand in the in the front doorway of the Mount Carmel compound for two hours or more, talking to David Koresh, and he came back and reported that he had made significant progress with him. David Koresh is also on record um, from uh, surveillance inside and stuff that he released that he believed this guy, that he felt like he was being at least sincere with him. So there was some progress being made, but you know what happened as soon as that dude was done? The fucking tactical guys turned on the screaming, dying rabbits again. It's like, what? Like, so it was almost like we gained a little trust with them. We might have made a little headway into getting some of these kids out of there, at least, maybe. And then they go right back to harassing them and firing gas grenades at them and shit. So there's no cohesive strategy. No. It's just Well, it's not only that there's no cohesive strategy. It's that there's two completely oppositional strategies being employed at once. Which we, as we know, that it's not going to work. Um, negotiators felt hamstrung by the hostage rescue team that made aggressive moves, blaring the music, crushing Davidi- uh, Davidian's cars. So they would take their tanks and crush their personal cars in front of them. Like, just making, like, o- obviously provocative moves at these people. And then uh, the negotiation team has to go in tomorrow and explain why their guys crushed everybody's cars. So, so yet again, a policy of continued yeah. escalation. They kept that's going to... Pro- that, provocation. Gonna, yeah, the, I mean, like, it just seems like the, the policy of the government at this time, based on their handling of Ruby Ridge and Waco, is just like... We're well, the mo- government. We're, the, we're in the right. Yeah, we're going to do whatever we need to do. And we're not, not only that, but, like, we're going to escalate the situation. Iron out fist of control. is what it seems like. Yeah, it's like, we got, we're the iron fist of law, and you will obey. And if you do not, you will be crushed. And people don't respond to that. I mean, some people will respond to that by being like, okay, fine, we'll be crushed. Well, it, it's the government have a, the monopoly on violence. But other people... And, that's, and just flexing that muscle to, to the these separatist groups. But you that, see a lot of these citizens of these these groups are not willing to fucking... Uh, they're not willing to fucking just bow down to that. They're just like, no, fuck you. Well, we're going to fight. Well, right. the, and the thing is the government, like we we, even, we talked about earlier, like, like you know, with that theater in Russia where it's like they just send in the fucking... Gov- the government just sends in the fucking military or the police the and Russian just kill... The Russian government, right? Yeah, the Russian government. Yeah, we're talking about the, the theater shooting that happened yeah. about 15 years ago or so and just if they have to kill the hostage whoever has to die has to die so i mean like look the government could have gone any time and killed all right. these people and say that wasn't you, the issue and say what you want about the russian strategy there i don't think it's the best way to go but it was cohesive and singular and right. it got the job done it wasn't like they were hemming and hawing between two different philosophies for 51 days right, right. and you got to make your decision like either you're going to solve this with diplomacy and you're going to try that or you're going to solve it with force 
Right. And, you know, I think that diplomacy is the better answer. I mean, Me diplomacy. Too. But if you're going to use force, then you got to be all out and just be like, we're going in there. We're going right. to kill everybody. But that, I, I don't to, think yeah. that's what most people would even want. I think most people want diplomacy to be exhausted. And, I mean, well, in the case of this group, too, it's but like. it seems like at this point, we hadn't really decided what we were going to do. Well, it was not. Yeah. But was, I mean, really, as a strategy, n- neither one were actually really tried fully because, no. like I said, the tactical strategy wasn't tried fully. The, the diplomatic angle, like, if they had given them, like, hey, you guys have two weeks to negotiate something and then we do this, that Right. one thing but it was never like like and Paul said two divergent strategies working against each other and almost. that's how I would assume things would go if there are two divergent schools of thought on how to deal with this all right let you try yours you've got two weeks and if you can't get him to s- release a significant amount of the children in there or whatever give him a benchmark and then we do that but that's not how it was it was like they were trying to do it all at once um, there's a quote that I wanted to read from a, a man named Byron Sage. He was an FBI negotiator, supervisory senior uh, resident agent on the case. He says, uh, on occasions, I made a number of trips up to the tactical sites located right out in front of the compound. There was one time uh, when there, uh, there was one time when there was a notation on one of the porta potties uh, up front that said, Sage is a Davidian. Obviously written by one of the tactical guys. So there was a real like rancor between these two types of teams and the same enforcement where, agency. To the point where they're basically saying, like, this negotiator guy This is bullshit. Yeah, he's, he's basically a he's on their side. He ain't on our side. He's with them. Well the tactical honestly, the tactical element was really I mean, to be fair with what, what I just said earlier, they did try their fucking approach and look what happened. Right. It was a fucking disaster. So I mean maybe a more uh, a, a more methodical strategy and trying to give diplomacy a chance to begin with would have been the actual the better fucking take here. Right. Um, so on April 19th, the tactical guys won and the FBI launched a raid. At 5.59 a.m., they warned the Branch Davidians that an assault uh, with tear gas was imminent. At 6, uh, tear gas began to be inserted into the compound with the use of spray nozzles on the end of armored vehicles that rammed into the building. Um at 12.07 p.m., after hours of tear gas assault, fires were lit in the compound, allegedly by the Davidians. The fire spread quickly. This is another major point of contention amongst the conspiracy movement um, because in the later investigations of uh, what happened at Waco, it was revealed that the government did indeed use incendiary smoke uh, gas grenade rounds on this compound when before they had maintained that they only used non-incendiary plastic rounds. It, it finally came out with evidence that they were indeed firing incendiary rounds. And you got to do the math here, okay? You're pumping these buildings filled with tear gas. People are going to retreat to the area where there's the least amount of gas. Sure. So who's going to be out there setting fires? Like, isn't it, isn't it, couldn't we play devil's advocates here and say it's equally as plausible that these were just gr- gas grenades that were fired in here and the fires raged out of control because there was nobody in that area to put them out because there was tear gas in the air? I mean, the only way that they could have functioned in tear gas if they were pumping that much in is if someone had, you know, like a fucking gas mask on or a filtration right. system. And remember, there are no, they, they did find some people, there were gas masks on the compound, but none of them fitted for children. So none of the children had any protection from any of this. No. You got to keep that in mind. So they would have been hysterical. I mean, you got to imagine. Um, at twelve twelve, a number of Branch Davidians gave up and left the compound. Um, at twelve twenty five, gunfire was heard coming from inside the compound, but it did not appear to be aimed at the law enforcement. So this was suicides inside as the building burned and there was no way to get out. Um, fire teams uh, began to. Uh, try fighting the blaze at about 1241 but by that point as you can see from the picture it was f- way, way yeah, beyond futile. there's yeah. no yeah there's no putting it out now that that building's burning to the fucking ground at this point I remember point. the other research we covered uh, too that because it was uh, there was so it was an active obviously there was gunfire going on that they couldn't they couldn't and didn't want to respond until almost it was like okay almost perfunctory like okay there's almost no chance of anything happening and by that point I right. mean the building's burned the fuck down um so by the time the fires were eventually put out or allowed to burn out, 80 Branch Davidians were dead. Uh, some had been crushed by fallen concrete walls. Some died due to cyanide poisoning, a result of the CS tear gas being lit on fire. Um, some died from bullets fired fired on that final day, with one at least being a suicide. At least 20 members had been shot uh, in apparent mercy killings so they wouldn't die in the fire. A three-year-old uh, was a, a reportedly stabbed to death. 
Five bodies of people uh, likely killed by the gunfire of the initial raid of the uh, of February 28th. So there were five bodies there that they thought these were the people that were probably killed in that raid. Um, 25 of the dead were under the age of 15. And 28, I believe, of the dead were not even U.S. citizens. They were actually British nationals, which is something that I learned in my research that I'd never heard before. Dude, was, um, the, was that fucking... Look, dude, the British invasion. Yeah. Apparently, there was a strong uh, resonation with some British people, and a large number of families had moved to be be part of the compound at Mount Carmel. Um, Koresh himself died of a gunshot wound to the head, and it's not it hasn't been determined if it was self self inflicted gunshot or not. So, as crazy as it seems to us, having the overview now and having the information that we do, and once again, this was just a kind of a broad overview of the principal events leading up to what happened. Sure. Um. Public sentiment remained strong in favor of the ATF and the FBI's raid. Right. Uh, once again, something in the order of three and four Americans were just fine with it. Um, so, yeah, did you pull up that th- that that book? I have it. What page is it on? Is this a page 168 thing? Uh, yeah, click that. Yeah, the page 168 thing. And uh, you can kind of, st- st- if you want to read it or you can put it up on the screen and I can read from it. Uh, uh, I just can't get it to. I'll go ahead and put it up so you can see what we're dealing with here. Okay. So this is from a uh, this is from a book called Mass Mediated Terrorism that I I didn't read the whole thing but I read a significant portion of and it has it's basically a book about the role that the media uh, plays in spreading the message of terrorists which is undeniable right it's a, it's actually a pretty smart book and a pretty good read if you're interested in the topic um, but let's see. I'm going to start where I think I am supposed to go. So by nighting the bomb on the second anniversary of the FBI's raid on the brand. OK, so we're talking about the Oklahoma City bombing here, who we covered. Uh, we covered um, Timothy McVeigh, who was uh, one of the principal um, uh, suspects in that bombing, who was eventually killed, uh, put to death for it, who was at Waco. And this talks about how he was profoundly um, influenced by that. So. Um, oh, can you scroll up a little bit? I think I need to start higher here. Okay. Do I need to go to this previous page? Um, no, no, no. You, never mind. I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's just hard to tell where to start because it's a... Right. It's like, a big block. Um, so Terry Nichols, who was uh, one of the uh, accomplices of Timothy, Timothy. I have so, trub- so much trouble with Timothy McVeigh. There we go. We're fine. Timothy McVeigh. <laughs> Uh, saying a word in the aftermath of the devastating blow that left 168 people dead and many more injured, the news ran with the clues that he left. By igniting the bomb on the second anniversary of the FBI's raid on the Branch Davidian sex compound in Waco, Texas, during which the cult leader David Koresh and 80 of his followers died, McVeigh made sure that the mass media would dig into his and like-minded people's causes and grievances against the federal government. More important, as the news uh, devoted a great deal of attention to the incident at Waco and the sentiments of right-wing extremists opposed to the federal government's alleged abuse of power, the public was reminded daily of the Waco nightmare that many Americans had probably forgotten. The result was a dramatic change in public attitudes towards federal agents' actions during the Waco incident. And as I looked into it, also the Ruby Ridge incident, that I'll, that's my own addendum there um shortly after the oklahoma city bombing in april 1995 nearly three and four americans approved of the action of the fbi in waco but three months later after intensive mass mediated debate of waco and oklahoma city two and four americans disapproved so it went from three uh, three quarters of americans are for it to half of america now thinks that the government has, you know, its, it's a, has its head. Well, up it's like when ass. it's a cursory so, news mean, story, it's it's really easy to see that. Okay, well, yeah, the government had to go in there. Those people were crazy. They're nuts, and you know, like they even saw the people that were on the ridge there. They're, like look at Mark Carmel. They were like looking at that and going, "Oh, look, there's a bunch of nuts there. They're all crazy." Right. They're so, just but when there's a nuts. robust debate uh, debate about the go- use of government force and power, and suddenly people go, "Well, wait a minute, did the government act appropriately?" I right. mean, and another thing you could say too is that this is an example of terrorism working. Yeah, because it actually no, it really is. It really, I mean, like people don't like to talk about the times that terrorism has worked, but this is the, if well, this is if the if the idea behind this is I'm going to draw more attention well, to exactly. what happened at Waco and is Ruby it, Ridge. He succeeded in it, that regard. Wasn't well, the modern analog now mass shooters? They leave these manifestos and right, stuff, and yeah. we give them attention. I mean, so do you guys feel 
that that's something that you should censor or you should say, look, we're not the media is not going to cover these people, their manifestos or anything. I don't, I don't know. know. I, I obviously don't agree with what Timothy McVeigh did, but I, I agree with the sentiment change. So I think that ultimately right. I agree with the change that it brought about. I mean, I his know. his I'll, I'll read a little more if you can scroll down just a, just a tad because it, it goes on to the next page slightly. It, um, it, I'll start at that last paragraph up there uh, following these developments closely. So after the bombings, after his arrest. Timothy uh, McVeigh was pleased that the FBI and Attorney General Janet Reno were treated much more harshly in the new round of congressional hearings on Waco. So he actually sparked a new congressional investigation into not only Waco, but a new look at Ruby Ridge as well, just by virtue of what he did and by putting those two things back in the national consciousness and back in the national con uh, conversation and making people aware in the country what the grievances of his uh, separatist movement were. Good, bad, right, or wrong. He put those things out, and um, it worked. It worked like a, like a charm, like he couldn't have planned it better. It literally changed public perception on what... Like, it changed how the government um, deals with these types of situations forever and always. The FBI has completely changed its rules of engagement now to uh, return to the more, um, you know, uh, mediative kind of uh, right. approach. Like, I mean, you could see why. I mean, this we is talked a case about of, it in the case of like the Clive and Bundy thing, where right. the response of the government to those separatists was much more measured than their response to, say, Ruby Ridge. Uh, but it's hard to argue, in the, I mean, or at least argue against in this case, that the ends don't justify the means, because, I mean, as, as horrible as a terrorist attack is, I mean, could you imagine them ever, ever taking Timothy McVeigh or any one of his ilk seriously? No, no nobody was at this time. And I mean, but uh, and, and so it's, I mean, it's one of those hard things that's like when violence is used, it does have results. So, I mean, people question why these violent actions happen. Like, people go into a building and shoot a bunch of people up. But, it, I mean, like, sometimes it's, a personal agenda, but when it's politically motivated, you can't say terrorists don't have an effect on, I mean, like, look at France. They have these military patrols. Look at what we've done. The, the vehicle barriers at a lot of popular places where people walk around. I mean, so it, it, there's the mitigation of terrorist acts, but it's also the what it you know does to put the public consciousness on those issues. I mean, we're a lot more aware now of what's going on overseas. And a lot of people talk about, uh, you know, like you watch Kyle Kalinske teaching, a lot of people talk about the blowback of U.S. foreign policy. Yeah. And how and how it affect? I mean, and those are conversations that I've like, had because of because of terrorism and violence yeah, and people and, blowing and shit also up. Also, I and, feel like you know the com it seems like domestically we kind of have come around to the realization like taking this this iron fist tactic, you know, a lot of times produces really bad results against our own citizens, right? Domestically speaking, yeah, yeah, but, and then but it, it seems like on the international stage we're still playing by the the other hand. Well, because we don't have Might to reap right. the whirlwind. Yeah. We don't have to reap the mass public, you know, backlash from it because it doesn't happen in our backyard. I mean, I think, sometimes I think it does. It happened if, on nine eleven. It did, but we didn't take the right lesson from that. Right, and and that is that is something that she quotes somewhere in this book, and I can't, I don't think it's here, but she talks about how it's almost impossible to imagine now that we've gone through nine eleven. And I thought that was the biggest load of bullshit in that entire election cycle, where they went after that uh, Jeremiah Wright re uh, Reverend. Right, uh, the Barack chickens Obama's. are coming home to roost. Goddamn America! Yeah. I'm like, wow, you're not even, and you're not even gonna, you're not even gonna really take seriously what he's saying, which is that maybe we we had a hand in creating nope. the situation. That he's just unpatriotic. He's not. He just hates America. He bad. He bad. Um, but yeah, it, have it's, we gotten it, dumber? It's almost unthinkable for us to think about um, actually the American public taking a serious look at a terrorist's demands or a terrorist grievances after 9-11 but that's exactly what happened in the 90s and it's all strangely interconnected with all of the things that we talked about tonight ruby ridge waco the oklahoma city bombing hundreds of uh, dead people yeah, I got, that's 168 all, people killed yeah all mm -hmm. for americans to come to the realization that we don't want the government to storm in and with bullets flying and snipers posted up that we don't want that we want the government to even even with people we don't agree with to take a measured fucking approach on our own soil and this is what it took this was the toll the death toll of that um, that bad idea within these federal uh, law enforcement agencies that might makes right that the iron fist approach is the best approach well, that, it, because it, what ultimately what it showed you is that the government 
through all its strength and all the power it can, you know, accumulate and, and the, you know, essentially we call the monopoly on violence. I mean, all it takes is two fucking dudes like Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols to just load up a fucking U-Haul filled with fertilizer, a fertilizer bomb and drive into a building. Right. And if you're going to ignore the like a lot of people, there are people that still to this day will be like, you can't blame nothing on that. They made that decision themselves. And if you want to ignore the psychological implications of them being immersed in a movement that kind of looked at these two events, Ruby Ridge and Waco, as like examples of the government trampling on them and, and further examples of their separatist kind of leanings. I don't know what to tell you, man. It's obviously a factor. I mean, it's really just a case of, you know, on a very primal level, you can kind of just look at it like, uh, hey, the government gave this movement a couple of black eyes, and then this movement came back and gave the government a fucking black eye. Right. And then everyone's just kind of like, whoa. And who won? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I... I mean, it, ultimately, I don't think there's... Just, it uh, seems like... I mean, I don't know. We haven't had any... Uh, I mean, obviously, there was a huge right-wing terrorist attack in uh, uh, New Zealand recently. But here on U.S. soil, it's been kind of a while, bef- at least since the last big right-wing terrorist attack. You know? This is true. The last huge terrorist attack in America was, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, a radical Islam. Uh, which I guess you can kind of think of that as right wing. Well, I mean, I mean that's a depend- different tangent well, of the right wing. It depends on what you call a terrorist attack, too. I mean, uh, I, I consider, some of the mass shootings. Yeah, I, cons- I consider qualified. Las Vegas a pretty major terrorist that's attack, true. I mean, yeah. despite the fact that for whatever reason the guy had no manifesto. But for some reason, you just. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, the manifesto didn't happen. The, the incredible disappearing I, I feel, manifesto. I, it, it just slips my mind all the time, the Las Vegas one. Uh, and I think it's there's there's some kind of design there. Like yeah, I feel yeah, like almost. a watch has been waved in front of me. You don't remember the Las Vegas shooting? Yeah, I mean it's it had a it had the same amount of casualty or uh, certainly close to the same amount of casualties as I uh, mean I think Oklahoma City anytime did. something reoccurs in a culture or a society, we have to question it and why it's occurring. I mean you can't just simply dismiss that oh these people are all crazy and there's no reason why they're doing this except they just want people to die. I mean and there's nothing we can do to stop it. Yeah, like I mean when you look at terrorism that way, I mean terrorism is horrible and the violence that it brings on the you know people is obviously terrible. Like no one's looking at these events and going, well these guys, I mean even if they had a point this is the right way to it's do it. It's not exactly terrorism if it's not terrifying. Right. And I think if there's a lesson from this weird episode tonight, it's that our response to terrorism can be equally as damaging as the terrorist act itself um, and can, um, you know, maybe even lead to more terrorism. I mean, it, it, as many cases has, um, unfortunately. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of meat still left on the bone of Oklahoma City as a topic. Um, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols are both pretty interesting characters and. The tale of the tape and the trial and the eventual execution of uh, McVeigh is a pretty interesting story. So maybe fertile ground for a future episode. I would say it definitely is. Um, but yeah, that's all I've got. How are we doing on time, TJ? How are we looking? Uh, we're only up to 17 minutes. Oh, shit. Oh, man. Uh, that only bought us two more minutes. Oh, oh my God. It felt like that was like at least like almost an hour. You're going to have to get up and just start dancing or something, dude. I don't yeah, know. Paul, go do your Paul dance. Hold on. Do the... I don't get up. All right. Thank you guys for watching. Good night. See you Friday.